talk about a book called Coma. A coma is the story of a young couple who are driving through Northern California on their way back from a visit to the north and as they pass Mount Shasta, which is one of the highest volcanoes in the whole of Northern California, their car is struck from behind by another vehicle. Their car rolls over and then they're struck again by a large truck. Both of them are very severely injured. And the next thing the young man who's driving discovers is that he's waking up in hospital uh, in a clinic and having completely lost his memory. He can't remember who he is, he can't remember his name, his background, he doesn't even remember that he was travelling with his fiancée. And uh, the doctors say that he's uh, suffered severe traumatic shock after the accident. The doctors and the nurses give him information about himself which they have obviously got from his credit cards and other documents that he had on him when he was driving. And they even bring his sister to see him who when she visits him, shows him photographs of himself when he was a child. They insist, however, that he stays in the community until he's better and he's undergone therapy to regain his memory. They take him down to a house to live with a woman for a while, while he's undergoing his therapy. And uh, she herself is undergoing therapy and the two of them, they hope, will be able to rehabilitate each other. They get on very well and they have a good relationship. But as time goes by, our hero begins to realise that things are not quite right. He wakes up one night to find 20 or 30 of the local residents standing outside his bedroom window in the snow, just staring silently at him. When he goes outside, they've all disappeared and they've left no evidence that they were there in the snow, no footprint. So he begins to get increasingly concerned about what's happening to him and who he is. And little by little, he begins to remember bits and pieces of his, of his previous life and who he might be. But he begins to suspect that something is very, very badly wrong. In fact, he even suspect, begins to suspect that he might be dead and that this is all is happening to him in an afterlife. This is a different style of book. It's not as out and out gory and grisly and brutal as some of my previous stories have been because I think people are looking these days for books that have got more depth and more meaning behind them. And in this one, one of the key questions that the book is asking is that why do we spend all our lives studying and uh, developing our brains and our minds when in fact all of that's going to be lost when we die? Now, as far as my new disaster novel, Drought, is concerned, uh, I've been had the idea for the Book of Drought years and years, in fact 15 years ago, just after I'd written my two previous disaster novels, Famine and Plague. And I had wanted to write Drought some years ago, and I was commissioned to do it, but my editor uh, left the publishing company I was working for, and the, the rest of the team didn't seem to like the idea of Drought, so it was shelved. Um, this year, when I saw that how severe a drought, a real drought, was happening in California, I thought I might revive the idea, although by now the real drought was so much worse than the drought that I'd imagined for my fictitious disaster that I had to make it even worse than, than the real one. And uh, there's nothing I like better than writing a really good disaster novel, like wrecking the world and seeing how ordinary people cope with it. This disaster novel contains all the things that you can expect from one of my disaster novels, which is A, the disaster hasn't rained for months and months and months, then there's political corruption that goes with it, then there's uh, violence, there's car crashes, two helicopters are brought down, uh, there's plenty of sex in it, there's also some Native American legends as well, we have to have some of those ever since the Manitou, but uh, I think there's a lot in there that you'll enjoy. The, uh, the new book about Katie Maguire, the uh, Irish detective who's based in Cork in Ireland, comes out too. It's called uh, Red Light. Um, part of the reason for that is because it's set in the Red Light district of Cork where there's a lot of prostitution and sex trafficking. Because Cork has become 
unfortunately, the vice capital of Ireland with a great deal of prostitution going on and a great deal of exploitation of uh, young women from abroad. Uh, in this book, Katie finds that uh, several pimps who are running the sex business in the underworld uh, have been brutally tortured and killed and she discovers that this is being done by a Nigerian girl who's come over from Nigeria uh, specifically to do this, although the reason for this only becomes apparent later in the book. But Casey's moral dilemma is, does she go after this uh, Nigerian girl who's killing some of the, the worst criminals involved in the sex trade that she herself has been unable to pin down and, and get into court and arrest, or should she just actually let this girl get on with it and do her work for her? So that's the problem she faces. Casey McGuire has become very, very popular. The first book, White Bones, and the second book, Broken Angels, have sold phenomenal amounts, particularly in uh, digital books, e-books. And this is the third book in what will be a continuing series, because Katie seems to become very popular. And I think this is because she's, although she's a detective superintendent, she's an extremely normal woman with whom particularly women readers can identify. She has difficulties with her marriage, she has problems with her ageing father, and she also has problems at work where the, uh, the men of the police force that she's working for are not very happy about having had a woman promoted over them. Then, after Red Light, there's Scarlet Widow, which is a crime novel as well, a detective novel, except that it's set in the 18th century. And the heroine, instead of being a real detective, is the wife of a pastor who has gone to colonial America to begin a ministry there. The heroine is the daughter of an apothecary from 18th century London. An apothecary was a chemist and he's taught her all about herbs and medicines and all the cures that people used to take in those days. So she's quite an expert when it comes to anything to do with chemistry. So the book is uh, really like an 18th century CSI, crime scene investigation. So when she goes to America with her new husband uh, and some murders are committed, while everybody else in the community believes that the murders have been committed by Satan, who doesn't want Christianity spread in his domain in the New World, she realises that somebody is doing this on purpose and, and how they're doing it how people are being poisoned, how they're being um, electrocuted and all kinds of other bizarre deaths that everybody else has put down to the devil. Um, as far as the future is concerned, what I have planned, um, obviously I will be writing more books about Katie Maguire because they've been so popular, um, but I also still haven't completely left the horror market. I want to write a book that when you read it, you won't be able to sleep afterwards. That's my plan. I've got an idea, but I'm not going to tell you what it is yet. You'll find out when you read it, and you won't sleep for a month. Other things I want to do, um, I want to work on some animations with my son Dan, who incidentally happens to be filming this interview. And uh, we have several ideas for short animations, which we hope will be both amusing and stunning and maybe scary too. People often ask me if I have any free time at all because I write so many books. But uh, I write so many books merely because I was trained as a journalist. And as a journalist, you have to do it, you treat it as a job. Which means that I can write actually quite a lot without it seeming an enormous amount and giving me a lot of spare time. My spare time I spend with my friends or my family or my numerous grandchildren. And, uh, and, and just relaxing and having a good time. So, uh, no, I've got no shortage of spare time at all. And as far as my Polish readers are concerned, as far as I'm concerned, my Polish readers aren't... I never think of them as fans. I always think of them... I don't even really think of them as readers. I think of them more as friends. I went to Poland three times last year, once to Poznan, to Piercon, the fantasy festival, and then to Krakow in the summer, and then Warsaw in the autumn, and met lots and lots of Polish friends I call them, not readers and not certainly not fans. I'm not Justin Bieber. And uh, 
every time I go there I make new friends and have made friends who have become lasting, really lasting uh, friends of mine and I, I keep in touch with them quite regularly. So Polish readers, you know, you are my friends as well as my readers, thank you.